Vietnamese and Mandarin Chinese. If you'd like to listen to the meeting in one of those languages, you can click on the circle or the little globe. I'm not sure exactly what it is. That icon that's at the bottom of your screen and then pick the language that, that you'd like to listen in. You will be automatically switched to a different audio channel, but still see the same video. Um, I wanna pause for a moment and um, let each of our interpreters um, just share those directions in language. Um, maybe first we'll start with Maria. Sí, buenas tardes y gracias por estar aquí. Eh, quiero dejarles saber que esta junta va a ser grabada y ustedes van a encontrar el icono en la parte superior donde va a este, estar grabada y va a haber subtítulos. Uh, esta junta por, eh, en sí está en vivo y van a tener la opción de escucharla ya sea en español, en, en vietnamita y mandarín. Si ustedes le hacen clic al icono que está en la parte inferior de su pantalla como si fuera un globo, este ustedes pueden, pueden escoger el idioma que ustedes necesitan escoger este, en, en el, y ustedes van a poder escuchar, pero van a poder en, en el canal de audio, pero para, van a poder ver esta um, presentación. Gracias. Thank you, Maria. Kevin. Xin chào mọi người. Ở màn hình của mình nó sẽ có cái quả cầu ở dưới. Khi mình bấm ở dưới đó, nó sẽ có quả cầu ở hiện lên, nó sẽ có tiếng Việt và mình sẽ có uh, người việc uh, thông dịch viên ở trong cái uh, phòng khác thì uh, nếu mình có muốn ai uh, nghe tiếng Việt uh, thì mình bấm cái quả cầu và bấm uh, tiếng Việt ở bên dưới. Thank you Kevin. Melissa. Sư Phạm Trung Hoa đi phương yếu, xin điền chi đi thầu đi chủ đề thủ biểu, chọn cho Phạm Trung Hoa đi hoàn nghệ. Xin xin. Thank you, Melissa. Um, on the next slide, we have just a few um, guidelines for people. We want to make sure that the meeting is accessible for everyone who wants to listen. Um, so right now, you are all in listen-only mode, which means there's no camera, there's no audio controls that, that you can control. Um, but during the presentation, if you have questions, um, you can submit them um, throughout the meeting using the question and answer box at the bottom of the screen. Um, when we get through the presentation at the end, we're gonna spend time on question and answers. And we'll take some of those questions. You can also at that point, raise your hand um, to ask your question out loud. So we're gonna have both of those options going forward and we'll talk more about how to use those features as, as we get a little closer. Um, I wanna let everyone know that if you do type a question at this point, they are only visible to the panelists. So you're not sending questions out to everyone. Um, but that gives you just a little bit, these are some of the ways that you can, you can participate in the meeting. Um, before we go into the agenda and some more logistics, I wanted to, to just give an opportunity um, and, uh, for some welcoming words. And so I wanna introduce um, Sam Zimbabwe from the Department of Transportation. Thanks, Angie, and good evening, everyone. Welcome, and thank you for being here. Uh, we're so glad that you decided to join us tonight on a beautiful evening. Uh, there's so many things to do on a, on a nice evening in Seattle in the summer. Tonight, we're even competing with an expansion draft for the new NHL team. I'm Sam Zimbabwe. I'm the director of the Seattle Department of Transportation. And the last 16 months have been challenging for our community for many reasons, including the global pandemic and more locally, the emergency closure of the West Seattle Bridge. People call West Seattle the city's largest neighborhood. It's true, it's such a tight knit community. I'm a public servant, I'm here to serve tonight, but I'm also a West Seattle resident raising a family here in the neighborhood. That largest neighborhood also extends to all of the communities of the Duwamish Valley. It's a diverse, multilingual, multicultural community. And also, and we see that in the sense of community that we have in our streets, in our homes, and during visits to the local businesses that we support, especially during trying times like these. 
The West Seattle Bridge is a gateway to West Seattle and a symbol of the neighborhood. It's also clear that it's part of a system that affects all of the communities in the Duwamish Valley just as much as the peninsula. Since we made the difficult decision to close the West Seattle Bridge in March of 2020, our priority has been first and foremost public safety. The 100,000 travelers crossing every day and the people and businesses in the communities surrounding and the spaces below the bridge. We immediately set to work prepare, repairing the bridge to prevent the cracks from growing and to stabilize the bridge. That quick work enabled us to be where we are today, moving ahead on the repairs that will enable us to return traffic to the bridge. I'm very pleased tonight to confirm that we are on track to reopen the West Seattle Bridge in mid-2022. We remain on schedule. Another priority is to build the projects that balance and improve traffic conditions and congestion along the detour routes with pedestrian and bicycle safety in, around, and out of West Seattle. Tonight, you're going to learn more about the community-led solutions to our collective challenges during an overview presentation of our entire West Seattle Bridge program in, in, in just a few minutes. But before we dig in, we are going to hear from both Deputy Mayor David Mosley and Council Member Lisa Herbold, who are both tireless advocates for the communities of West Seattle and are real champions of the projects and the effort that we are undertaking here. Thank you again for being here tonight. And I'm going to pass it off to Deputy Mayor David Mosley on behalf of Mayor Jenny Durkin. Deputy Mayor, we can't quite hear you if you are. Um, I don't, Sam, I don't hear Deputy Mayor Mosley. Okay, these technical, technical challenges yeah, uh, can happen to everybody. Um, well, I can say a few of the remarks that uh, that I know uh, Deputy Mayor Mosley wanted to share with everybody. Um, he is he. Uh, well, we're all here on behalf of uh, Mayor Durkin, who uh, couldn't be here tonight because she has been in the other Washington in D.C., working hard on our behalf with the Biden administration and our fabulous members of Congress to secure the resources uh, that we will we need to uh, to repair the bridge. Um, so uh, with that, I can turn it over to uh, Councilmember Herbold if, if she's here and uh, able to, to, to join us as well. Let's give it a try. Councilmember Herbold, are you here? And we're not having good luck right now. I I see Council Member Herbold. I have just been promoted to a panelist. Thank you, Here everybody. You <laughs> Welcome. <laughs> Thank you so much. Really appreciate it. Great being here. Um, and thank you for having this forum. I um, want to first start off by saying how much I appreciate Director Zimbabwe um, noting the importance of moving as quickly as possible to repair the bridge and really, really appreciate um, every day the mayor's decision to repair the bridge which can complete, be completed several years more quickly than it would have taken to actually replace the bridge. We all know that the closure of the bridge and restrictions on the use of the lower level bridge have been very hard on our communities, our residents and our businesses alike. It's become more difficult to get to work, visit relatives, friends and get to other parts of the city. And for many, it's resulted in less time available to spend with loved ones and doing things that we like to do. 
Since the day that the bridge was closed, I've been hearing from District 1 residents and businesses about how traffic and speeding have increased on numerous West Seattle streets and in South Park too. I've heard concerns about safety and about travel times. SDOT has built over 200 projects so far to add signs and crosswalks. They've changed signal timing. They've improved pavement conditions and they've worked to slow traffic on neighborhood streets. I encourage them to continue doing more and I really appreciate their openness to collaborating with the community on emerging, on emerging issues like traffic on 16th Avenue Southwest near South Seattle College and Sylvan Way um, as detour traffic increased there. We really rely on the input of the community to identify these emerging issues as they, as they come up um, so that we can uh, work with SDOT and elevate um, the need and get uh, attention to those, to those areas. I think most people know that the council has already passed legislation committing to funding the repair of the bridge and the budget to fund safety projects and work such as the repaving that took place on Roxbury earlier this week, the work that was done at the bottom of Highland Park Hill this weekend. And I really uh, thank my, my council colleagues for joining me in acting quickly to provide necessary funding every step of the way. Tonight, SDOT is going to highlight a number of the projects that they've already completed and talk about more that are planned. I appreciate SDOT prioritizing this work and it's been really good to see this level of progress made so quickly. Now that businesses are opening up again, we hope that these projects will make it easier for people to spend time in our neighborhoods instead of driving through. And, and, and we want people to support our local businesses. You know, I, I hear a lot of people contact me or asking, well, why are we doing these, these transportation construction projects in West Seattle when it's so hard to get around? These projects are designed to make it easier to get around and safer. I wanna thank the tireless advocacy of Congress Woman Jayapal from West Seattle and Senators Cantwell and Murray and the rest of our federal delegation for believing in this project and attaining important federal funding. And then uh, of course, as always, thank you to um, everyone who's here with us today for taking time to listen and engage with us tonight. And thank you for continuing to contact my office um, to let me know um, about where the needs are greatest in, um, in your communities, particularly the communities that are on the detour, detour routes. And um, with that, uh, thank you for giving me an opportunity to make these opening remarks. I'll pass it back to our facilitator to start the program. Thank you. Um, I, I got a little excited and wanted to get right to um, the introductions. And so I skipped over the agenda. So Cecilia is gonna go back a slide to the agenda. Um, you know, we are, as you've just heard, this is kind of the, an overview of what we're gonna talk about tonight. Um, just a, a general overall um, presentation on the repair work, on the updates, what's been going on, um, some information on using the low bridge, how that's been going, as well as the work that's been going on to keep people and businesses um, moving to and through West Seattle as part of the Reconnect West Seattle and the Stay Local and Plan Ahead um, efforts. And then we'll also talk a little bit about long-term planning studies um, for the bridge um, going forward. So we'll spend a bit of time on that presentation and then we will have a good chunk of time for um, a Q&A session and then, and then we'll adjourn the meeting. After the meeting, we will post uh, frequently asked questions that addresses many of the questions that came up today. And then if there are some that we don't get a chance to answer, um, we also will post a uh, PowerPoint and, and the uh, video and the recording of the meeting in case you or want to review it again or if others weren't able to watch it. Um, 
Let's go to the next slide and just review the um, Q&A feature so folks know how to do that. Um, there are some of you who are already submitting questions, so some of you know how to do this, but we just want to review how this works. So as you're listening to the presentation, if questions can come up, if questions come up for you, you can submit those now and throughout the meeting. So click on the Q&A button that's at the bottom of your screen, and then you can just type your question. And it will only be visible, as I said, only visible to the panelists. If you are using a screen reader, then you should push the tab button until you hear the question and answer prompt. Um, and then you can press enter to open the Q&A box. Press the tab button again until you hear enter your question. And then you can type the question and press enter. So before we start into the presentation, um, we have a couple polls that we would like people to fill out that'll just help us know a little bit about who's listening um, and where your information is, you know, where you get your information. So I'm going to launch the first poll here, which is asking you to share with us what zip code you're tuning in from. So all you have to do on the screen is just click the little button that's next to the zip code that, um, that matches and I, I will share the results when they come in, or, you know, when, when we're done. We've had about half of the people have voted, so we'll give um, just a, a little bit more time. It's kind of fun on my side to watch the number just climb with all the people who are voting. Um, so take a minute and click that for us. I'll leave, maybe give it another five seconds. I'm gonna end the poll. And then just so that you all can see it too, so that you can see the results here, sharing those results. Um, many of you are from 98116, that's 33%, but we do have a spread of folks um, from a variety of zip codes. And then um, a couple of you from outside of Seattle and other, zip, other Seattle zip codes that are, that are not listed here and, and connected to um, the sort of immediate project area. So um, I have another poll I've got one more question for you here. We've, we've got a couple more later, but we would love to know how you heard about the meeting. Um, this helps us in knowing what is the best way to reach out to folks for future meetings. So click any of these, you can click more than one. What are the ways that, that really reached you um, so, that, so that we know which ones maybe to focus our energy in going forward, if you're willing to share. A lot of you are clicking email newsletter, I can tell you, because it's coming up. Um, so we'll give that a minute for you to, to make some choices there. Okay, uh, I'll give it just a few more seconds. Okay. Um, I'm going to end this one and I will share this with you just so that everybody, we're all, we've all got the same information here. 54% um, of people heard it through an email newsletter, so that's great. But there's some of these other, you know, the West Seattle blog is reaching a lot of folks. Um, and then there's a variety of other, you know, people are hearing about it from their friends, which is also great. Um, so we appreciate you letting us know. That helps us uh, know how that we can, how to direct some of our efforts going forward. Okay, before I'm go, I'm gonna pull down the polls here, but before we jump into the presentation, um, Deputy Mayor Mosley is now uh, in the Zoom. So I wanted, uh, Deputy Mayor, sorry about the technical difficulties earlier, but wanted to give you a chance to share a few words if you'd like to do that. Uh, can you hear me? We can. Okay, well, I'm not sure how to put my picture up, but then that probably is a benefit to people anyway. So uh, I'll just, uh, speak. I want to thank everybody for coming. Um, Mayor Durkin is coming back today from D.C. and I can tell you that a lot of her activities in D.C. over the last couple of days have been directly related to um, support for the West Seattle Bridge and the adjacent uh, streets that uh, are, are part of that important um, corridor. Uh, it's also, of course, vital for the Port of Seattle and the Northwest Seaport Alliance. So uh, uh, that has been a large part of her reason for being, spending a couple of days back in DC. In fact, she met with uh, 
Secretary uh, Buttigieg, Transportation Secretary, yesterday and earlier today. Uh, Sam and I were on with a call with her, with um, um, Deputy Secretary Trottenberg, uh, all on, uh, and uh, as well as uh, some of the members of the Washington delegation, all on issues related to uh, the West Seattle Bridge. And I, like um, uh, Council Member Herbal, I want to thank our Washington delegation that's been so helpful in this. Um, uh, certainly the Senators Cantwell and Murray and Congress members uh, Jayapal and Smith, uh, they've been very active and engaged in this. And um, I don't know if Sam mentioned this earlier, but there is actually some, a, a bit of good news tonight. Um, uh, happy to announce that the state has just awarded us $12 million in federal local bridge funds that it's federal money, but it flows through the state uh, Department of Transportation and uh, they have awarded $12 million for the West Seattle Bridge. And this now brings total of federal funds, both directly from the feds and through the state of almost $38 uh, million. So uh, we, are, we are continuing to make progress on uh, uh, receiving the kind of support that we need for this vital transportation corridor and uh, are very thankful for everyone's help on that. And um, I wish you all a, a wonderful evening. You're, you're great citizens to stay inside on a beautiful evening like today. So thank you all very much. Thank you, Angie. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. Um, I think we want to jump in now to all the information that, you know, start sharing that information that you all came here to, um, to hear. And so we'll start by introducing Heather Marks. Um, Heather is the director of the West Seattle Bridge Safety Program. Um, Heather, I'll turn it over to you. Good evening, everyone. And thank you so much for joining us. Hopefully you can hear me and I have not uh, proliferated the technological problems that we've been having. Um, I am speaking to you from uh, the sunny uh, neighborhood of Fauntleroy and uh, pleased to welcome you all here today. I want to thank everybody for your patience as we set this meeting up. We're doing this uh, simultaneous translation um, and it's sort of the first time we've done this and so I appreciate everybody's patience um, as we introduced all of that content. So um, as everyone here I'm sure knows the bridge has been closed since March of 2020. Uh, after we found growing cracks in the structure during a routine inspection. Uh, the cracking was likely caused by insufficient post-tensioning in the bridge as it was originally built. So all of you who are wondering what's wrong with the bridge, this is what is wrong. Uh, the post-tensioning strands are steel rope that tighten the bridge and strengthen the concrete. We'll talk a lot more about that as we move through the material this evening. Uh, the bridge was built according to the standards of the day. Uh, at that time, there was less knowledge in the engineering community about some of the properties of concrete and um, a, a phenomenon that's called creep. Um, no specific defect or fault was found in any of the designer construction documents. It was just a question of um, the engineering knowledge not, uh, not being where it needed to be for this kind of a bridge. Uh, of course, as soon as we closed the bridge, we immediately set to work on emergency stabilization work. You know that that's what was happening all of last year. Uh, we successfully halted the cracks from growing larger and preserved uh, the ability for us to either repair or replace the bridge. Um, next slide, please. Uh, in November, you may recall the mayor made uh, an announcement that we are going to repair the bridge because it's the fastest path to reopen the West Seattle Bridge. Um, we know, I know, uh, that this bridge closure has created huge challenges for the West Seattle and Duwamish Valley communities. As I mentioned, I live here. Um, repair is the fastest way to get a re uh, reopened bridge, and we are on track to reopen in mid-2022. 
Um, we would love, believe me, I would love to give you a very specific date when we're going to open it, but we're at intermediate design, not final design. And so that very specific schedule of what date we're going to open is just not available at this point. Uh, we continue to work with our contractors um, to define that schedule in, in a very um, specific and deliberate way. Next slide, please. So anybody that knows me knows I know I like nothing better than a checklist. So um, we have closed the bridge and completed the, the stabilization work we needed to. Uh, we achieved that repair decision from the mayor. We have completed all of the stabilization work and we have selected the contractor who is going to be doing the ultimate rehabilitation work. This fall, the very careful and exacting structural engineering design will be complete. Uh, this, this, uh, the end of this year, we're going to begin the rehabilitation work. And then, uh, as I've mentioned, we expect to open the bridge in mid 2022. Next slide, please. So um, it's such good news uh, that uh, Deputy Mayor Mosley announced um, we have secured significant uh, partnership funding from the federal government and um, some of those dollars passed through WashDOT. We're also working with other local partners to um, secure additional funds. Uh, we continue to monitor the bridge uh, to inform additional repair work. Uh, we've selected Kramer North America to do that repair work. Um, we have applied to USDOT to be able to use a community workforce agreement that will allow us to hire workers from disadvantaged zip codes. That way we can bring the benefits of um, an open bridge as well as repairing the bridge to the community that it serves. Uh, we've also reached that intermediate design milestone earlier this month. What's up next is finalizing those repair designs with our uh, consultant WSP and our contractor, Kramer North America. Uh, this, uh, later this year, we are going to begin those repairs and the bridge is on schedule to reopen in mid 2022. Next slide, please. So this is kind of a cool 3D image that shows you the work that we're gonna do. This shows you one of the tail spans. So there's the center structure, which you're familiar with, and then the two um, sides are called tail spans. So center span and tail spans. And um, most of the work on this bridge is going to take place inside the giant box girders that support the road. Um, there's going to be some external carbon fiber wrap. There's going to be additional post tensioning with steel cables on the inside of the bridge that will go from one tail span all the way through to the other. Um, and then, of course, some internal carbon fiber wrap. I want to note that structural engineering is a discipline um, that uh, it's very exacting, uh, it's very precise. Bridges are designed to, um, they have a bunch of what they call members that support uh, and reinforce one another. And so any uh, change in weight of the bridge, which you would get when you add a bunch of steel rope to the, the inside, um, changes other parts of the bridge. And so this is a very careful, very highly mathematical process. Um, I, I just want to gently draw your attention to South Florida and the tragedy of those collapsed structures to reinforce for you how important it is that we get this design exactly right. Public safety is our number one responsibility and our number one concern. And so we are not gonna move forward until we know that the designs are exactly right. Next slide, please. So I'd like to turn it over to my friend and colleague, Maureen Sheehan. Uh, she's gonna talk about the low bridge. Hi, I'm Maureen Sheehan. I'm with uh, Seattle Department of Transportation. I am the Low Bridge Program Manager. Um, next slide. So when the high bridge closed, we lost about seven lanes of travel, um, which is a huge loss. Um, one of the remaining connections um, is the Spokane Street Swing Bridge, also known as the Low Bridge, which is located directly under the high bridge. Um, the low bridge carries about one fifth of the number of vehicles as the high bridge. It all also opens regularly for boats to pass, which interrupts traffic on the bridge. 
Um, after closing the high bridge, we had to immediately limit access to the low bridge to ensure that emergency vehicles, including ambulances, could get across the bridge when they had to. We carefully prioritize low bridge uses because we know that it's extremely important to keep traffic moving so that the low bridge is accessible to people traveling on transit and to people driving trucks and workers headed to port facilities. Um, and this is why we had to put restrictions on who could use the low bridge in order to keep congestion down and to keep traffic flowing. Um, we installed an automated enforcement system. It's important that you don't use the low bridge during the restricted hours. If you do travel across the bridge during the day, during those restricted hours, you will receive a $75 ticket. At night, the bridge is open starting at 9 p.m. through 5 a.m. in the morning. Anyone can use the bridge um, during the week, Monday through Friday. On weekends, anyone can use the bridge between 9 p.m. and 8 a.m. And just a reminder that anyone can bike, walk, or roll across the low bridge at any time. So we know that a lot of community members would love to be able to use the low bridge, and we've been closely monitoring the available space on the low bridge. Through extensive outreach to the community and data gathering, we were able to identify a few user groups that we allow to use the low bridge during restricted times, but only temporarily. The following groups need to apply and be approved before they are allowed to use the low bridge. So this includes individuals receiving life-saving medical treatment, on-call medical workers, West Seattle-based restaurant and retail businesses, maritime and industrial businesses, um, union members who are um, being dispatched to port facilities, as well as government vehicles. Again, all travelers must apply and they must meet the criteria and receive approval from SDOT before they can use the low bridge. If you think that you fall into one of these groups, um, feel free to request access at the link below um, on the screen here or at our website that you'll we'll share later. So in 2022, there'll be a significant reduction in the space available for us on the low bridge once Terminal 5 reopens. Um, Terminal 5 is being modernized by the Northwest Seaport Alliance to accept larger ships, <clears throat> excuse me, um, strengthening our region's position as a key international port facility. It will reopen in January 2022, and when it does, there'll be more trucks traveling across the low bridge than there are today. We're currently assessing how much space will be available by looking at how many vehicles the bridge can carry per hour, how quickly traffic clears when the low bridge opens for those maritime vessels, as well as survey data from our current users. Um, if you are a current user of the low bridge, um, an authorized user, we want to hear from you. So please check your email um, later today and we'll be providing a survey to better understand your needs for the low bridge. Next slide. So our next steps for the low bridge is we're gonna continue to assess how much space there is on the low bridge and look for opportunities for people to use it. It's our intention to maximize the low bridge while also continue to make sure that emergency vehicles, including ambulances, Transit and freight can get through and the corridor doesn't become overly congested. We'll continue to seek out input from community members about ways we can help. And again, we don't want anyone to receive citations. So please stay up to date on changes um, regarding the low bridge. Thanks, Angie. Thanks, Maureen. Um, we're gonna do another poll. So uh, I'm gonna launch this poll so you can all take a look. This one also is multiple choice. We would love to hear from you how you wanna receive updates about the West Seattle Bridge program in the future. So you can check as many of these. So we know how you heard about the project or about this meeting, but how would you like to hear it going forward? So what are things that work for you? And uh, there are a lot of options here. So scroll down too, because there's some phone calls are at the bottom of the list. So just wanna make sure that people see all of those. Um, so take a minute, there's a lot of choices here. So I'm gonna pause and let people, um, let people read it and then click some, click some buttons.
I'll give it another 10 seconds or so, um, since there's a lot of choices here. Okay, I'm going to end the poll and then I will just share this with you as well. It sounds like the um, email newsletters and the blog posts, people really are appreciating those. So that seems like a really, that's a good use of resources. Um, some of the social media and text message notifications. And then there's some of these other options that maybe, maybe people don't use um, quite as much. So that's great information for us uh, going forward. Okay. I'm going to take down the poll and uh, introduce Sarah Zora. Sarah is the Reconnect Seattle Mobility Manager. So we're gonna turn it over to Sarah to share more about how things are moving around and through West Seattle. Sarah. Thank you so much. Yeah, Thanks, great. Angie. <laughs> Appreciate that. If you go to the next slide. Um, I'm Sarah Zora. I'm here to talk about the ways that we're trying to address some of the immediate issues that have been caused by the bridge closure. Uh, so we know that closing the high bridge and losing those seven travel lanes that Maureen had addressed um, has been causing some major impacts for everyone. Uh, we know that there's been increased travel volumes and uh, travel times on the detour routes. There's been speeding and cut through traffic in the neighborhoods, as well as environmental health impacts uh, from the congestion and added pollution. Uh, along those detour routes. Um, we have, uh, while we know the travel impacts have been felt by everyone, uh, we are um, especially feeling for the South Park, Highland Park, and Georgetown communities. These communities and neighborhoods are uh, directly associated along the uh, detour routes and they're experiencing heavy volumes of traffic as well as cut through traffic in their neighborhoods. Um, so the bridge closures have, uh, impacts have been felt disproportionately by communities of color and lower income Seattleites. And if you go to the next slide, we're working on, um, on how to help ease these improvements uh, through the Reconnect West Seattle program. So if you see the map on the right-hand side of the screen, um, we have implemented over 200 traffic projects, uh, traffic mitigation projects to really help the ease ease the congestion and increase safety and predictability for all travelers. Um, the map really reflects those 200, over 200 traffic mitigation projects as well as community prioritized projects. Um, we are continually um, working with community to learn what and how they've been experiencing um, the bridge detour closure um, as well as um, um, uh, being very participation with the city of Seattle so that we can ensure that we're building projects to really help mitigate those, um, the issues that we're seeing in the neighborhoods. Uh, we're continually working on revising traffic signal timing, signage, real time information, paving different detour routes uh, to really ensure that we are focused on uh, maintaining good predictability and accessibility on those routes. Uh, the community projects are really important um, and we've built additional traffic signals. We've installed a lot of speed humps, added radar feedback signs to help control the speeds, um, and allowing people to walk um, and, and have more pedestrian mobility within the neighborhoods. If you go to the next slide, part of those neighborhoods that we're really focused on, uh, like I said, are South Park, Highland Park, and Georgetown. And we're implementing uh, a program that we have at SDOT called Home Zones. Um, it's really involving the entire neighborhood working together to promote and prioritize improvements that would help calm traffic in these neighborhoods, um, improve pedestrian mobility and safety, as well as create um, some better um, activation and beautification, such as adding street trees into these neighborhoods. Um, we've already begun, uh, we, we conducted an inclusive process in these three neighborhoods um, at the beginning of the year, uh, including community safe, uh, COVID safe community walks to really learn and listen and talk with community that's experiencing the impacts of uh, the high bridge closure. Um, we have been implementing projects in the home zones with community um, uh, and we'll continue to do so into 2022. If you go to the next slide, I really wanted to address a package of, of improvements that we're uh, making on West Marginal Way. As you all know, West Marginal Way is a major detour route. Since the closure of the High Bridge, we've seen about 15,000, um, an average of 15,000 vehicles per day using that route. Um, so we have a package of improvements to try to ensure that we're making West Marginal Way uh, safer, more predictable, and more functional for all the travelers. We have completed a few projects 
projects already along the corridor, such as installing um, 30 miles per hour speed limit signs and radar feedback signs. That was a citywide initiative to really try to focus on our vision zero goals by reducing uh, speeds on major corridors. We've also installed a west side sidewalk to really connect um, and provide better access to the Duwamish Longhouse. Upcoming here in the next couple months, we'll be installing an actual traffic signal and crosswalk for better access and safety uh, and predictability uh, for access to long, the Duwamish Longhouse at the Herring's House Park entrance. And we'll be also including more markings on the pavement to ensure that business driveways uh, can be kept clear and accessible as West Margin Way has seen some uh, larger volumes of traffic. In the future, um, after the West Sale High Bridge reopens, we will be building a two-way protected bike lane and on-street parking within a 0.6 uh, mile of the two and a half mile quarter. This is really to ensure um, and maintain uh, predictability for all users. Uh, this will ensure and maintain the major truck street designation and freight mobility. Um, this outside travel lane that we're gonna convert from a travel lane to a two-way protected bike lane or on-street parking will just maintain that single southbound lane from the Chelan five-way intersection underneath the bridge structures and then into West Marginal Way. We're gonna maintain that single lane cross-section for people driving vehicles until after the Duwamish Longhouse where it will open up again to a two-lane cross-section on West Marginal Way. This really helps achieve um, our Vision Zero goals uh, by eliminating zero traffic deaths and serious injuries on Seattle streets. It provides um, alternative options for people to get around their neighborhoods, as well as uh, committing to climate action goals uh, that we have at the city as well. Uh, if you go to the next slide, I'll talk more specifically about near-term improvements that we're making uh, that construction just started last weekend uh, to really improve traffic flow um, at, West, at the West Marginal Way, Highland Parkway intersection. We know this is a major detour intersection, uh, and these improvements are really going to help it move more efficiently. The big primary driver of the intersection improvements is to ensure that we can have a, a double left turn lane from southbound West Marginal Way to eastbound Highland Parkway at the same time as a right turning movement from westbound Highland Parkway to northbound West Marginal Way. So you'll be seeing SDOT crews uh, removing um, portions and whole uh, uh, the traffic islands out there. We'll be relocating the bus stop to the far side, the westbound side um, of the intersection on Highland Parkway and improve uh, the curb ramps to really accommodate um, accessibility to those bus stops as well as um, adding accessible pedestrian signals um, around that intersection. We will be doing this construction now as, as we have just started um, and we're going to be mostly leaning towards weekend work with our crews starting as early as morning hours 3 a.m. so that we can try to um, be out of there when traffic starts picking up again. We will have uh, um, maintained travel lanes uh, during that construction. We expect to complete that construction by the end of the next of quarter three September uh, 30th. If you go to the next slide, I'm going to still stay on and talk a little bit more about um, um, being part of the response. How, how can we um, help uh, with different travel options and help to um, stay local and plan ahead for when you do make trips across that Duwamish waterway? If you go to, yep. Um, so we do have one more slide to go. Um, uh, one more year to go, I'm sorry. Um, we have had uh, the COVID-19 restrictions have lifted and the high bridge will be reopened in about a year from now. Um, so we do have quite some time to go um, and we know that the detour routes are, uh, travel times on the detour routes are increasing. So we need to really have everyone work together about how uh, to handle this level of congestion with the loss of those travel lanes um, that we will not get back until that high bridge reopens. Um, for what we have going on, if you go to the next slide, please. Um, we will be adding 30,000 annual transit hours in West Seattle starting in October. Um, we will be adding bus frequencies such as um, on the Route 50. We're going to be doubling that frequency to 15 minute headways uh, so you can get a bus from Alki to the Soto Link station more frequently during the day. Uh, we're also partnering with other agencies such as King County Metro um, and other businesses to, in the community to really promote uh, some of the travel options that we have, you know, um, and we'll be working and going to community events to really try to promote um, different ways of traveling 
feeling if you have the opportunity to try it, a way to make a different trip. Um, we're going to be launching an incentive program um, in, towards the end of August uh, to really help in, ensure that people have a system to a platform to use to really um, incentivize their trips. And um, we are working with large employers as well. So uh, to really promote um, West Seattle people, Duwamish Valley uh, um, employees to continue to work from home or to use their uh, uh, employer shuttles or van pools and uh, bike if they can get to work in a different way than driving their personal vehicle. If you go to the next slide, please, um, because all of your all of your choices do affect everyone. Um, so flipping a trip is is really important. We have Sal the Salmon trying to give you all tips on uh, different ways you can get around if you're able to change one trip um, that you can change to either walking or biking. Um, uh, riding the, your bus or taking water taxi or traveling and staying local is something that you can do. If you are traveling on the detour routes, uh, we really recommend staying on those detour routes, not cutting through on neighborhood streets and trying to be a neighbor and know that you are with other uh, West Seattleites, Duwamish Valley residents um, that are trying hard uh, to really find a way to uh, work through um, the impacts that you're feeling with the high bridge closure. We do have trips on um, tips on our travel uh, options website as well if you need any other support. And I will pass it to Wes who will talk about um, our bridge replacement study. Thank you. Thanks, Sarah. Um, so my name is Wes Ducey and I'm the project manager for the uh, long-term eventual replacement of the high bridge. Um, as we go to the next slide, I'll just kind of reinforce that with this timeline here. Uh, I live in West Seattle. And I'm, I'm eagerly awaiting the reopening as well, mid-2022. Um, and we expect the bridge to last uh, for another 40 years, which is setting our eventual replacement of the high bridge at about 2060. Um, so just want to kind of reinforce that separation of this work, which is very future focused, which is a lot of the on ongoing work to get our bridge back open to keep traffic flowing um, right now. Um, we launched a study in June at the Community Task Force, and um, we are taking this action now just to ensure that we're more prepared um, for the time when the time comes to replace the structure. This corridor is extremely constrained. Um, there's, there's existing infrastructure that is going to be um, activated at Terminal 5. There's planned infrastructure coming this corridor. We really need to do the work now to really think about where replacement will fit into this constrained cord corridor as it becomes more challenging in the future. Um, so if you go to the next slide, um, the real why for this work stems from Mayor Durkin's direction last November when she uh, directed us to wisely repair, um, but also continue the plan for replacement. Um, this will allow the city to respond more quickly if an unlikely event does occur between now and 2060. Um, and it really, it really amplifies the, the understanding that we're gaining about traffic moving across through and to the Duwamish Valley um, and really carrying that understanding forward into this study's work. Um, we'll do a kind of a needs assessment of the different modes of traffic moving across the Duwamish Valley um, focused on a high bridge replacement. Uh, but the real focus of this study is to look at where the location of a replacement bridge would be best suited. So we'll look to the north of the existing bridge, to the south of the existing bridge, um, online where the existing bridge is currently um, and a, a tunnel as well. Um, and this step is really the first of many. There are certainly other questions we'll ask as we get closer to the 2060 time horizon of a replacement, such as size and type of a structure. We're really focused right now on the location and, and doing some kind of feasibility work to see uh, what can work and what can't and how we can minimize impacts to a lot of the operations that go on around the bridge. Um, and this work um, is happening pretty quickly this year. As we move to the next slide, um, we're trying to be efficient in carrying that understanding forward in this study, um, but just doing this work very quickly. So we'll, we'll report on the draft findings from our study uh, later this fall in the community task force um, and have had ongoing. We'll continue to coordinate with Sound Transit and the Port of Seattle. Um, and then we are completing this study's work by the end of this year. Um, so we'll be, 
bringing that work back to, at the end of this year to the community task force, but also posting on our website and really encourage you to find more information about this future focused work uh, on our website. And with that, I believe I'll pass it back to Angie. Thank you. Thanks, Wes. All right, we have our last poll. Thank you for your patience with the polls. Some people love them. Um, and so this one here is about going it just told me that the recording was in progress. Um, okay, uh, so what, uh, when you hear from SDOT, what program updates are most important to you? And I do wanna note, I had a couple comments from folks about wondering why the numbers equal more than 100%, and that's because people are able to select more than one option. So you get to choose multiple. So things don't always equal 100%. So take a minute and tell us what's most important for you that helps us focus uh, the outreach and, and communications that we are looking at going forward. We'll give you a couple minutes um, so that we can let's say 10 more seconds as you're picking the things that are most important to you. Okay. Uh, I'm gonna, three, two, one, and the poll. All right, so I'll just share this so that you all can see what your neighbors have been saying. 87% um, of the people who responded clicked repair progress, um, but also a lot of other topics as well. So um, I think this gives our uh, team you know, a lot of good information so that the SDOT folks know what's the, what's the, best way to, both the best way to reach out to you and the topics that people are really um, interested in. Okay, I'm going to stop sharing that. Uh, Danielle Friedman, who works on outreach and engagement for the West Seattle Bridge, um, is just gonna share one slide on how to stay up to date, and then we're gonna go into the question and answer. Danielle? Thanks. <clears throat> yeah, speaking of getting information, we have a number of ways for you to be involved. Um, invite us to speak with your group, we're always happy to attend your meetings. You can email us at westseattlebridge at seattle.gov or call our multilingual phone line. And visit our website to keep up, keep up to date. There's lots of information on there about all the topics covered tonight. And I encourage you to visit our website to subscribe and get email updates. Thanks, Danielle. Okay. So we are ready for the Q&A session. Um, we've had a lot of questions submitted. So we wanna make sure that we get to as many of those as possible. Um, but we also wanna give people an opportunity to ask questions verbally. Um, and you can do that in English, in Vietnamese, in Mandarin, or in Spanish. Um, to ask a question verbally, you click on the raise hand button that it's at the bottom of your screen. And that will let us know that, you're, that you'd like to be on the list um, to ask a question verbally. Um, if you're using a screen reader, the Alt Y button raises and lowers your hand and then Alt A mutes and unmutes you. We'll first allow, you know, unmute you from the, the webinar side and then you would uh, unmute yourself from your side. Um, if you'd like to write in your question, just to remind you, you can use the Q&A um, button, the little icon. For screen readers, again, press the tab button until you hear the notice um, or you hear the question and answer prompt and then tab again until um, it, it prompts you to enter your question and hit enter. We have a lot of people here and a lot of questions. Um, we're gonna go back and forth a little bit, do a few of the written questions and then do a verbal question. For those of you who are speaking, um, I've got a little bit of mixed guidance for you. One is to speak slowly so that our interpreters um, can interpret what you're saying, but we're also trying to limit the speaking time to 45 seconds or less so that we can get through as many questions as we can. We're also going to ask our panelists to keep their uh, responses um, brief if they can um, so that we can we can just move through questions 
and get those answers for folks. Um, also reminding folks to, to be courteous and be polite in the, in the questions when we unmute, um, just to, to make it a good experience for everyone. Okay, uh, let's go ahead and start. We've taken down the presentation. Um, and so some of the, some faces are on the screen here. Vamos a comenzar y... Sorry. Maria, we can hear you. Um, um, if Chris could change me to the Spanish channel, that would be great. Thank you, sorry for interruption. Yes, great. I will pause for a moment so we can swap out interpreters. Okay. Um, I am looking for our staff who are sharing, um, who are sort of compiling questions. So I'm looking for one of those. Mm -hmm. Tôi đang tìm một người nhân viên để cùng tôi hỗ trợ để mà mình. Okay. Um, so I have a question here for Sam Zimbabwe. Sam, what can be done to speed up the repair? Um, there does not seem to be any sense of urgency to complete repairs. The burden on West Seattle residents has been substantial and patience seems to be wearing thin. Thanks, Angie, and thanks for that question. Uh, I can assure you that there is urgency in uh, our work to achieve the repairs. As Heather described earlier, um, there is some very delicate design that still has to be done. And uh, then we have to procure materials and complete the repairs. Everybody at SDOT is working urgently to get those repairs done day in and day out. Uh, and although you can't see that work on the bridge today, that that day is coming and we're working towards that as quickly as possible. Thanks, Sam. Question for Heather. Um, is the construction contractor on board now? Why hasn't the design been done over the 18 months the bridge has already been closed? So um, thank you very much for your question. Yes, the contractor is under contract right now. And in fact, they are working. Um, they are working with us to develop the final design. Uh, design has actually been underway for a significant portion of the closure. Uh, first, they were designing the stabilization work that was necessary to keep the bridge from actually falling down. Uh, and then they started the design once we had the repair decision, they decided, started the design uh, in November of last year uh, for this um, final uh, rehabilitation work that we're doing. So actually design has been going on for, for the entire 18 months. Thank you. Thanks, Heather. Uh, question for Council Member Herbold. Stay local in West Seattle is such a good idea. Can we promote more services in West Seattle? Golf driving range um, next to the West Seattle golf course, hotels in West Seattle are needed too. I'm happy to do whatever I can to uh, promote more services in West Seattle and the use of the services that we have. I just saw a really nice note from somebody on the chat um, about the information that I provide every week in my in my newsletter. If um, folks have ideas about how to put a focus on um, either a, a type of services um, that we have right here in West Seattle or um, particular providers of those services, I'd be happy to use my newsletter to do that. And I just want to also, um, in this uh, uh, sort of topic of how to how to promote um, all of the um, the great businesses we have here in West Seattle I want to thank the Office of Economic Development for everything that they are doing to support our small businesses um, during this difficult time everything from working with SDOT in the uh, in the um, uh, in the allocation of the lower level bridge passes but also um, in funding um, small businesses that are um, have been harmed um, through the, the pandemic and are looking to open up their doors. So um, I think we all can do more and I'm, I'm happy to uh, hear from you on, on what you think I should be doing more of. Thanks, Council Member Herbold. Uh, question for Sarah, water taxis. 
Have there been any thoughts on increasing the frequency of and extending the hours of the water taxi? Um, and have you considered adding a passenger or water taxi, um, I think passenger ferry maybe, or water taxi from Fauntleroy to downtown? Yeah, all oh, those are great questions. Thank you. Um, yes, uh, the water taxi is uh, owned and operated by King County, uh, King County Marines. So we have to work closely in partnership with our other um, with our uh, eight other agencies. Um, they are on their uh, summer sailing schedule now for the water taxi, which is quite beneficial. They have more frequency um, during the day and at nighttime. Um, and water taxi ridership has been increasing. So we have seen that that is a great benefit to uh, for people to have choices uh, in getting around. Um, we did take a look at the potential for adding additional foot ferries, um, potentially along the Duwamish Waterway. Um, and uh, the assessment we had um, seemed like it would not necessarily uh, achieve the, the mobility option in the time frame that we would need it in, in order to um, ensure that that option was available for uh, prior to that high bridge reopening um, in 2022. Thanks, Sarah. All right, Wes, your turn. We're going through all the panelists and then we'll do a, a, a hand raise. Wes, once the bridge is repaired, will work continue on a new bridge? The bridge couldn't handle the traffic prior to the closure, so just returning to the status quo seems um, short-sighted. Well, since, since we are looking 40 years ahead for the eventual replacement of the bridge, um, we are focused right now on the best location for the replacement. I think one thing I may have glanced over in my presentation is there's a fair amount of work to just figure out how much traffic we keep flowing during construction of a replacement. And that's, that's a lot of good work to do right now to really hone on that location. Looking at things like future number of lanes 40 years in the future or the type of the bridge would be something we'd revisit. Um, 10 to 20 years before we're ready to replace it at a, at a sooner time when there's more relevant uh, modeling to, to rely on for that information. Thanks, Thanks for the question. Yeah. Maureen, um, why not open up the times to use the low bridge? Most of the time, especially on weekends, the bridge is mostly empty. So we did recently extend the hours that the low bridge is open on the weekends, um, extending the morning hours to 8 a.m. instead of 5 a.m. Um, and we continue to evaluate and look for opportunities. Right now, our analysis shows that if opened, the demand for the low bridge is high enough that traffic volumes would rise above the point where the bridge would be a reliable corridor for emergency vehicles, transit, and freight. Thanks, Maureen. Um, let's do, let's call on one of our um, audience members who's raised their hand. Um, Jacob, we're going to unmute you and you can then unmute yourself and speak your question. Hey, um, I'm a homeowner at Fairmont Park and on the weekends I like to use Uber and Lyft to get to Capitol Hill. Um, and it currently seems that uh, we cannot, Uber and Lyft cannot use the low bridge from nine to five when it's open to everyone. And ultimately that means the cost of the detour is put on to us and that's about $20 to $30 each way. Um, and I know the reason for not allowing Ubers uh, from nine to five is so that uh, residents can use the bridge. Um, and I'm just kind of looking for an improvement here where maybe um, from 11 to 5 a.m. Ubers can use the bridge because there's less uh, residents using the low bridge at that time. Um, or maybe ideally, uh, Lyfts and Ubers can just use the low bridge from nine to five like everyone else. Um, I know from 9 to about 11, uh, there's quite a backup to use the low bridge already, um, less so on the weekends, um, which is when I personally would rather want to use Lyft to get to uh, Capitol Hill. Um, so I'm wondering if uh, we can make some changes there um, to help reduce my cost and increase uh, safe uh, driving choices for uh, residents here in West Seattle. Thanks, Jacob. Uh, Maureen, I think maybe we send that one to you. Yeah, so a similar similar response to the question earlier is we are always looking for opportunities to expand access. Um, it is a very finite resource. And so trying to find groups that can fit within the access of the low bridge, um, we totally hear you about um, 
getting on and off, uh, getting to and from West Seattle and using Uber and Lyft. Um, but right now that group I think is just too large for us to um, reliably be able to grant access to those folks and still um, have reliable access for those uh, emergency vehicles. Thanks Maureen. Uh, let's see, another question here. Um, this is a question for Heather. It feels like there is construction. Uh, oh, sorry. Uh, it, um, for one of our interpreters, I can hear you. Uh, oh, uh, this is uh, Alan Lai speaking. Can you hear me? I can. I can. Yeah. yeah. Oh, OK. OK. Um, question for Heather. It feels like there is construction happening everywhere, like on Dell Ridge Way. Um, what are you doing to coordinate construction work while the bridge is closed? So um, that's a good question. Um, Del Ridge is gonna be finished in just a couple of months. So uh, we have uh, not very much longer to uh, wait until all of West Seattle can use the amazing improvement that uh, is going to be a totally repaved and reconfigured Del Ridge. Um, we are coordinating construction. Um, one of the things that we um, do is we try to do any construction that's necessary, not big giant things like Del Ridge. That if we did that only at night or only on the weekends, it would be under construction, you know, eternally. Um, <clears throat> we make sure that the work that we do, for example, at Highland Park Way and West Marginal Way, is early, early in the morning or um, we make sure the paving that we just did on Roxbury was in the middle of the day instead of uh, during the peak times. It's not perfect. Um, we really do want to make sure that uh, we're taking care of the, especially the, the uh, sign detour routes to make sure that they're smooth and easy to travel. Um, and, and that's work that has to be done by real humans uh, out in the world. We do everything we can to make sure we can complete that work uh, on off hours. Uh, so we're not there right in the middle of, of the peak times of the morning and the afternoon. Thanks, Heather. Did that, did that answer? Okay. I think so. Um, <clears throat> question for Sam. Are you currently working from home or commuting to your office downtown? I am doing a mix of both. Um, like many folks, uh, I've been re mostly remote. I'm in my house, uh, tonight, pretty close to the Alaska Junction. Um, I do commute downtown uh, and I commute mostly on a bus or using my bike. I have definitely uh, driven across the Duwamish as well and know the challenges of commuting during peak hours. Uh, I also wanted to add a little bit onto the response to Jacob's question earlier about Uber and Lyft. Uh, I'm not sure we all understood the question perfectly, but if you were talking about overnight hours from 9 p.m. to 5 a.m., those are hours where it, it is available for uh, Uber and Lyft and anybody traveling across the river to use the low bridge. Um, and we can we, we will reach out to those companies uh, that, and make sure that their routing apps understand that as well um, to try to make sure that we address that issue. Um, they're using their own routing apps, so we can't tell them where to go, but uh, I think we can make sure that, that those apps understand what the hours of operation are. Thanks, Sam. You know, Sam, um, can I just add to that? I'm sorry, Angie. Uh, many of the mapping apps actually just did a big like reboot. And so some of our instructions that had been in place to them were uh, kicked off the island. So um, we're in the process of talking with all those apps right now to get that, uh, to get that fixed. Thanks. Thanks, Heather. A question for Council Member Herbold. Um, many times during the presentation, uh, the presenters use the phrase at the direction of Mayor Durkin. Um, how many of these projects, for example, the bridge replacement or traffic revisions could be voided under new mayoral leadership? Really good question, um, and I um, I think there's a straightforward answer, and there's a more complicated answer. I think the straightforward answer is the um, city council um, votes on the budget for um, for the direction that SDOT is is moving in as it relates to repairing the bridge um, instead of replacing the bridge. So if 
there was uh, interest under um, a new administration to go a different route. Can't imagine that would ever happen given how far we've come. Um, they would need the council support to do so. Um, we would need to provide the funding. Similarly, um, you know, we have this fantastic Re Reconnect West Seattle program that is funding these 200 projects along the detour routes is making funding improvements um, or uh, uh, repair improvements to the to the lower level bridge um, and other capital projects. This is funding that the council um, has has voted for, and so making um, changes um, from emphasizing assisting um, West Seattleites um, in their efforts to get quickly and safely to their locations, um, uh, that, would have to be, that would have to not only be proposed by the mayor, but the funding to do so, to, uh, to, to strip the funding from, from those budgets would have to be approved by the council. I can't imagine that happening either. You know, a lot of the approach though, the more complicated answer um, is that um, a lot of the approach that SDOT has been uh, pursuing for working with the community to prioritize projects has happened um, because of the leadership of SDOT under um, the mayor that we have today. Um, and so I would hope that we continue to um, work really closely with community members in identifying what the priority pro uh, projects are moving forward. But the, um, you know, the, the council budgets at a high level, the decision-making around a lot of the nitty gritty um, happens at the at the executive level, and so that's that's where it gets a little bit a little bit more complicated. But I don't see any big changes happening to um, the over years worth of work down the path that we've been going um, under a new mayoral administration. Thank you, Councilmember Sarah Zora. A question for you: um, What is the Seattle Department of Transportation, the Seattle Police Department, and Washington State Patrol doing? to ensure that people are waiting their turn when lined up trying to leave or enter West Seattle, particularly where people are cutting in line between 99 to 509 intersection around the transfer station. Um, I'm Trevor Partab and I think I'll- a friend on that one. Yeah, yeah go ahead. exactly. Um, so the best way to address uh, driver behavior is through enforcement. And we have been working with SPD to Seattle Police Department to um, monitor this area, and they have been doing that, and they will continue to do that. Um, we can also send them a reminder. Um, the other interesting thing you might, uh, or the other thing you might find interesting is that this is actually a wash dot um, roadway at this point, and we'll continue to work with them to see if there's um, engineering options to help uh, ensure that people uh, wait their turns in that queue. Thanks, Trevor. Um, we're going to do one more question for our panelists, and then we'll do an, another question from the audience, uh, spoken question. So Maureen, are motorcycles allowed to use the low bridge? And if not, why? Motorcycles are not allowed to use the low bridge. Um, because of the limited space, we're not prioritizing the use of the low bridge for most drive alone commute trips. Um, low bridge policy prioritizes emergency vehicles, freight, transit and high occupancy vehicle trips, um, urgent medical trips, and urgent and unplanned trips for some businesses. Thanks, Maureen. Um, Paul, I may not get your last name right, I apologize. Paul, is it Bescal? Um, we're gonna unmute you and then you can unmute yourself and go ahead and ask your question. Remember to speak slowly and keep it within like 45 seconds. Thank you. This is actually Paul Besco. So you actually got it. Yeah. Um, I actually have two really brief questions. One is that what could have done to prevent this from getting to this point of having to shut down the bridge? And what's to like, what kind of monitoring are you doing of the other bridges that are in effect, like the Aurora and the, uh, the low bridge to make sure that those don't get shut down for some other reason. Um, and the other thing is just safety and visibility coming out of side streets onto the detour route. Thank you. Looking for a panelist who might wanna jump in and, and answer, answer Paul's question. I 
Oh, you boss. <laughs> I'm happy to I'm happy to take a shot at the first one, and maybe I'll turn it to Sarah or Trevor for the second one. Um, okay. So the first question was about how uh, this could have been avoided. Um, I think, unfortunately, as Heather talked about, the bridge was built to the standards of the time when it was built, and we, ha in looking back through uh, through all the records of design and construction, we haven't found a fatal flaw that wasn't done. Um, we caught the cracking, the rapid growth of the cracking because of uh, an inspection program that looks for just these kinds of defects. Uh, the stabilization work that we completed um, uh, and the repair work that we will complete uh, require opening up the deck of the bridge, the roadway deck of the bridge to allow access into the bridge. So at whatever point we had caught it, there was going to be a period where the bridge was closed to do the work that um, that is now has been done and will will be done to bring traffic back onto the bridge. Um, I think, uh, so I, th I hope that answers the, the question from you, Paul. Uh, it's a very good one. It's one we've, we've asked ourselves. Uh, in terms of monitoring other structures, we have uh, added to this bridge and to the low bridge, and we have on several of our other structures, real-time monitors that look for um, the types of changes in the bridge structure that might lead to structural problems like this one and those related to the, the unique structures that each of our bridges are. Um, we have programs to maintain our bridges, to invest in them with uh, small scale repairs and sometimes larger scale uh, repairs or replacement. Um, and so in this bridge and in many of our other bridges around the city, we've added that instrumentation that helps us understand as problems emerge. And Sarah or Trevor, I don't know which one of you wants to take some of the visibility issues on side streets into yeah. arterials. Yeah, thanks. <clears throat> Thank you, Sam. Thanks for the question, Paul. Um, yeah, so through Reconnect West Seattle, we are trying to ensure that we have good uh, predictability and efficiencies when you're entering onto those detour routes and traveling through and within those detour routes. Um, so through the Home Zone program, we have been really trying to focus on how those interactions uh, work as you are entering onto those detour routes. We definitely would love to hear if there's locations that specific locations that you're finding difficult, and then we can have our engineers um, get out there and evaluate uh, any additional improvements. Um, so if there are um, specific intersections or cross streets that you are having some difficulties, uh, we would still love to hear them. Um, you can uh, email the West Seattle Bridge at seattle.gov uh, for a more specific um, interaction with us and our team about um, evaluating some of the specific uh, impacts that you're feeling at this time. Thanks, Paul. Um, Heather, a question, a written question for you. Um, has SDOT considered opening up the bridge um, for limited traffic? Cars only, no trucks or buses. Um, the person hasn't seen any data that would indicate that the bridge can't handle limited traffic. Um, good question. Uh, no, we have not. And there are a couple of pretty good reasons for that. The first is, you remember how earlier in the presentation I talked about how the the surface of the road rests on these two giant box girders. And so there are actually holes in the surface of the road right now so that we can get into the box girders. Um, and so that's, that's not a great choice for cars. Also, um, our engineer of record, the engineer whose uh, personal professional and licensure rests on good decisions about the bridge, um, has told us that that is not a safe option. So I appreciate the creativity. And uh, trust me, if, if that's something that we could do, we absolutely would, but it's just not safe. So thanks so much. Thanks, Heather. Uh, Wes, what is the plan for light rail on the new bridge? So current schedules for the replacement of the high rise bridge looking to 2060 um, and the Sound Transit West Seattle Bower Link Extension do not align. Um, we will consider uh, a look at modes and feasibility of including modes in our structure in the future. Um, but really we're focused on a location for our long-term replacement. And it's certainly in the same area as the planned light rail project. And that will need, need to kind of continue our coordination to inform each other's work in this area. Thanks Wes. Thanks. Um, before we go to the next question, 
Um, we are at 6.50. Uh, we have about 10 minutes left in our scheduled time, but um, let for those of you who are able, we'll stick around until like 7.15 and keep going through questions since we have quite a few that we haven't been able to get to. So we'll, we'll keep going. Um, a question for Sam, how can all these construction projects improve traffic flow given the construction impacts? Delbridge has been torn up since right after the bridge closed. Others continue to impede travel. Should we be doing so many projects at the same time while the bridge is closed? That's a good question. So the um, Heather answered a, a little bit of the question about Delridge. That, that project is making great progress and the major road work should be done in the next couple of months. Um, there have been a lot of uh, small scale and some larger scale uh, changes that we've made. And those, uh, those changes do require uh, construction. Early on in the bridge closure, we added uh, the signal at Highland Parkway and um, Holden Street on the major detour route. We've done upgrades, added turn signals. Um, Sarah talked earlier about the changes that are starting construction at West Marginal Way and Highland Parkway uh, now. Um, all of those do require construction. Our focus has been on making those safety improvements, uh, those small scale changes that might uh, pl uh, address places where we're seeing bottlenecks. Um, and we're trying to schedule those that work at times when it is as least impactful as possible. So that includes weekends, off peak hours, uh, and times to avoid further impacts to the detour routes because we understand just how impactful the detour and the construction has been on folks. Thanks, Sam. Question for Sarah. Is there any way to set up additional or temporary park and ride locations, especially near the low bridge, um, to make it easier to use transit, meet a van pool, or bike across the low bridge? Yeah, so there actually is an existing um, park and ride lot underneath the high bridge um, as you're approaching the low bridge at Southwest Spokane Street. So we do have um, an applicable uh, park and ride right near the low bridge. That would be a great use for people to do a multi-trip drive to the park and ride and take another mode across that low bridge. It's a really uh, beneficial thing that people can think of to um, make a trip in a different way. Thanks, Sarah. Maureen, a question for you. Will you be offering passes to the low bridge for school age students that have to travel out of West Seattle to get to their school? Thanks, Angie. Um, so school buses can access the low bridge as can Metro buses, so those transit buses. Um, we're also encouraging families to pursue rideshare licensed vehicles as a way to get across the low bridge, um, as well as high occupancy vehicles. So, um, getting a carpool together, finding other students in your neighborhood and traveling out of West Seattle together in those high occupancy vehicles is gonna be your best bet. Thanks, Maureen. Um, another question for Councilmember Herbold, and then we'll do another live question. Um, Councilmember Herbold, can individuals pay a premium to use the lower bridge, which might help with funding? I think there are two answers to that. The first is, um, Paying a toll uh, would require, uh, as I understand it, a vote of the public. Um, the other part of the answer to that question is really a question of, is it, would it be fair to allow access to the bridge uh, only, or to prioritize access to the bridge for those people who can afford to pay? Um, and so I, 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 in my mind, those are some two pretty significant hurdles to, to that question. Thank you. Um, for another uh, person who's raised their hand, um, Leonid, Leonid, you, so we've unmuted you. You can unmute yourself and remember to speak slowly and keep your question um, brief. Keep it under 45 seconds. Go ahead. You have to unmute yourself. It looks like you're still muted. Yeah. Yes, hello. A couple of questions. First of all, it's the city fault to add fourth line, lanes on the bridge, allowing commercial traffic 
trucks, container trucks from the port. It has to be that the reason. And are you going to change this back to three lanes? No trucks, no commercial traffic like it done in New York City. And are you going to compensate people for all this two years of mad driving, losing customers, not seeing friends, and losing hours, uh, spending money on uh, gas, depreciation of the cars, and other things? People don't want to come to West Seattle due to this fault you are allowed to change to four lanes and no limit on the weight and traffic from the port. Thank you. Thank you. Um, who might be able to, to start with that answer? I'm happy to uh, jump in on that one as well. Um, we don't plan any change to the operation of the of the high bridge when it reopens. Um, we expect that the, sorry, Tammy, I think I hear you also on this channel. Sorry. <laughs> it's okay. Um, it's, it's great to have the real time translation and it just creates a few logistical challenges. Um, so uh, we don't expect any change to the operations of the high bridge when we return traffic to it. Um, there's no indication that the change in uh, in travel lanes a few years before, you know, or I don't remember exactly when that change was made. There's no indication that that change led to the structural problems that uh, the bridge faces. Um, and so if, you know, as our repairs are successful, uh, we will be able to return the same operation to the high bridge. Thanks, Sam. Um, we have another written question submitted for Heather. Um, does SDOT intend to promote a kindness initiative for drivers who use the detour route? This is a great question. Love kindness initiatives. What do you think? Yeah, I actually love this idea. Um, and I know that we um, have woven those ideas of um, patience and grace for your fellow travelers into a lot of our communications, but I think something specific might be a really great idea. Um, you know, as you know, we are all in this together. Um, all the people that are on the detour routes are your friends, your family, your neighbors, your friend's friend, might be me. Um, maybe that's not a benefit, but um, we, we really, we know this is frustrating. I, I absolutely know how frustrating this is. Um, and we have to sort of put that aside as we're doing that travel. Stick to the sign detour routes. Please don't drive through the neighborhoods. You wouldn't want somebody doing that in your neighborhood. Um, make sure that, that you um, extend to people the grace that you would hope that they extend to you. Um, and know that everybody who's making that trip on those detour routes is doing it for a purpose that's important to them. You know, maybe it's medical, maybe they wanna go visit friends, uh, maybe they're headed to their yoga class. Um, so just remember that, that the West Seattle community, as Sam said at the very beginning, is very small and very intimate. And so um, you gotta make sure that you are treating all those other people on the street, just like they're your friends and neighbors because they are. So thanks, we'll, we'll see what we can do about an actual campaign. Thanks, Heather. Um, Sarah, a question for you. Is there any way the bike paths can be cleaned? Um, West Seattle Bridge through South Park to Tukwila um, and also on Fauntleroy Way it has broken glass and debris on it. Yep, um, those are definitely good heads up for us and we can um, uh, go back to our crews and we can get them cleaned out as soon as we can. Thank you for reporting on that. Um, our team is queuing up a couple more of the written questions. Um, so we have a, well, here's one for Heather and then we'll, we'll see if we have more time um, for some of the verbal questions. Heather, will the same number of lanes be used when the bridge opens? Um, I think this is similar to the question that, that Leon had asked, but um, it's my understanding that the bridge was not designed to support the additional outside lanes that were added used by trucks and buses and perhaps contributed to the cracks that were formed. And when the bridge reopens, will you remove the 0.4 mile bus lane? It contributes to significant car backups and transit backups too, and probably played a role in the damage to the bridge. Oh, 
you're on mute. Put a dollar in the jar. Um, so th those are some interesting suppositions. Uh, yes, we expect to return the bridge back to its original configuration. Um, I think we're gonna try to put wider shoulders on the westbound side, but, um, but as far as the, the uh, bus lane goes, that is gonna remain there. Turns out that all of those buses that are using it were using it before there was a, bu a bus lane there. And so without getting into um, technical structural engineering, um, the additional buses are, are not, uh, were not the problem. The problem was an imperfect understanding of how much post-tensioning uh, the bridge needed. I wanna note, somebody else had a question about, um, you, most of the time post-tensioning is actually inside the concrete. So, um, now it's external. So if you go into the girders, you see all of it and you can check how tight it is. But um, in the original design, it's inside the concrete. Um, so yes, we expect the bridge to um, go back to its original configuration and continue to serve the people of Seattle for the rest of its uh, expected life of 40 years. Thanks, Heather. Um, Karen Conley, um, why don't we go ahead and, and We'll unmute you so that you can speak slowly, ask your question, um, and and yes, yeah, so go ahead. <laughs> I didn't have an end to that. Chris, can you unmute Karen? There you go. Karen, now you need to unmute yourself too. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, uh, two full question. They're both very short. Uh, one is with the low bridge and the access starting at 9 p.m. Are you sure that that's the wisest decision? Because at 8.58 p.m., there is a massive backup every night of people getting on that lower bridge. It, if you have an emergency vehicle, it's going to have a lot worse time getting through that than it would if access were, were more, if it were earlier, you know, if it were more spread out, because that's a real hazard if you've got an ambulance. The other question is, uh, back to Sam's response about all the construction projects, I didn't really get a response about why they all have to be started at the same time. Thanks, Karen. I can take the first half of that question about the, the low bridge and folks queuing up for it to cross as soon as the, the 9 p.m. Um, access opens up. I think that's something we're gonna have to, to work through as, as a community together. Um, I think it's gonna happen whether we open the bridge up at 8 p.m. or 10 p.m. So I think keep that in mind of why we're keeping the bridge access restricted. So those emergency vehicles, when you are lining up for the bridge um, and and, just keep that in mind that we're trying to do this for, for emergency vehicles so the, for the West Seattle community. Thanks, Maureen. Sam, did you want to answer that second part? Um, yeah, I, I mean, I, I tried before to answer, I think, a very similar question. Um, we're trying uh, as quickly as we can to mitigate some of the impacts of the, uh, the detour routes. We recognize those that construction on those has does have additional impacts, and so that's why we work very hard to do those that work at times of day and in a sequence that minimizes those additional impacts. Thanks, Sam. Um, Heather, here's a question for you. It's maybe an easy one or not. Uh, when will we start seeing workers on the bridge again? That's a great question. Um, so uh, funny, uh, we actually had a little bit of a pre-construction work that happened on Monday. It was some um, asbestos uh, testing. And so I think if you, if you make a habit of watching the bridge, you will start to see workers come and go. But um, the way that this project is, is the, the main bulk of the rehabilitation is actually gonna take place mostly inside those box girders. So I think in November, you'll see the work platforms uh, go back up like they did last July so that they can do some of that um, external car carbon fiber wrap. But the bulk of the work is actually gonna happen inside 
those girders. And so it's, I'm afraid it's not gonna be as satisfying as watching like the Northgate Bridge go up. Thank you. Thanks, Heather. Uh, a question for you, Sarah. Um, Thistle Street, which is also an arterial, needs to be evaluated as there has been an increase of vehicle volumes, um, speeding and backups at the 35th signal, making it difficult to cross the street for walkers and also for residents to enter and exit their driveways. Yeah, this is a great comment that is very important for us to hear from the community members so that we can get our engineers and our um, signals operations team out there to uh, continuously analyze the signal timing here. Um, we will take this back and evaluate this intersection further to see if there's any other changes we can make um, that can be made to signal timing or other improvements for people walking and driving through that intersection. So I appreciate you um, making that point to us and we will get on uh, and evaluate evaluate that intersection. Thanks. Thank you. Um, Heather, are you working closely with the Port of Seattle and preparing for T5 or Terminal 5 to come online? Uh, yeah, um, we are. We, I'm sorry. We, we talked with the Port of Seattle at multiple times every single day. So yes, we're working very closely with the Port of Seattle and the Northwest Seaport Alliance um, about when Terminal 5 is gonna open and what that's gonna look like. Um, they expect to open Terminal 5 in January. And so that's why some of the initial work that we need to do, some of the standard repairs that we need to do on the low bridge, um, we're trying to get those to all happen before uh, the Terminal 5 opens. Um, the reality is that uh, Terminal 5 is a huge terminal and there's gonna be a significant increase in freight traffic. Um, and so that's one of those things that we're working with them on. Um, it's, it's not easy. Um, I do wanna note that um, if you have it, it arrived to you on a truck. So freight is an incredibly important part of our system and we have to make sure that, that those trucks can, can make their movements so that apples and wheat can go overseas from uh, Eastern Washington. And so, you know, toys and games and food can come to us. And so uh, food and materials can go up to Southeast Alaska. Um, but we are working very closely. So uh, we're, we're trying to mitigate those changes as much as we can for, for uh, your typical West Seattle traveler. Thanks, Heather. Um, we have just a time for maybe just a couple more questions. I know we have some of our panelists who might have to drop off. Councilmember Herbold, I know your your time is is tight here. Um, All right, just heading over to the Morgan Community Association meeting uh, that started at seven o'clock. Thank you all for for being here, and um, again, be in good touch with my office um, as uh, future impacts are um, are emerging. I will do my do my best to lift your voices. Be well. Thank you. Um, I'm looking to, oh, it said our recording has stopped. So um, we're going without a net right here. We're not being recorded. Um, so let's see if there's maybe one more question and I'm gonna ask my, my folks who are, who are channeling all these questions, um, if you have one that you really think that we should do as kind of a, of a last question. Um, Maybe I'll ask this one um, for Sarah and, and Trevor. Um, people are asking about how we're managing traffic at Highland Park um, and West Marginal Way. So can you add signage on westbound West Marginal Way as cars approach the Chelan intersection to prevent cars from cutting over from Delridge right turn lane into the Spokane Street lane um, that increases backup um, in the lane due to the cutting in and letting those cars in. I can jump in real quick. I think there's two questions there. So one is at Highland Park and West Marginal. So I'll start with that one. Um, so we are constantly monitoring or monitoring the intersection operation and adjusting signal timing as needed. Um, you'll also might remember what uh, Sarah was talking about earlier. We were um, we are in the process of making some um, improvements. We're going to add a second northbound lane through that intersection. We're going to um, also allow the southbound left turn and the westbound right turn. I know that might be a little bit uh, 
confusing, but we'll allow those two movements to go at the same time for all vehicles. And that will actually improve the intersection operations greatly. Um, heading over to up the road to West Marginal Way in Chelan, um, we can definitely, as I said earlier, we can work with uh, Seattle Police Department to um, ensure that behavior um, and you know, people cutting in at the last minute um, is uh, recognized and uh, dealt with through enforcement. Um, but we can also look at op engineering options to help um, alert drivers that, um, you know, in, in advance, uh, which lane they need to be in to go where they're going. Um, thank you. I guess I'll just leave it at that. Thank you. Um, I'm going to do, this is a last question we're sending out on, on this question here, Heather. Um, during the heat wave, were any expansions or contractions of the existing cracks in the bridge observed? Did any new cracks in the bridge appear in this time period? You know, in the in the unprecedented heat, did you know how did the bridge perform? Uh, that is a great question and one that I'm thrilled to answer. So, because of all the stabilization work that we did last winter and fall, uh, we got all the the readings that we expected to get from the bridge. So nothing else terrible happened because we've already done that stabilization work to keep the bridge from you know, falling down. Um, we also noticed exactly the readings that we expected to get when we got a whole bunch of snow. And you may know that snow is very heavy. So um, we are really confident um, in the stabilization techniques uh, that we used and those are gonna pivot into the final repairs. The stabilization work is actually a, an integral part of those final uh, repairs and rehabilitation. Good question. Yeah, thanks, Heather. Um, I think that we will wrap the, the Q&A session. And I want to remind folks that um, if you didn't get a chance, if your question didn't get answered, um, or if you didn't catch all the pieces of the, of the questions, um, there will be a frequently asked questions document prepared. That'll be posted on the website, as well as the video, um, the recording from, from this meeting. And I was reminded that we are still being recorded. Um, I think Council Member Herbold was also recording, so that's what I heard. Um, so that'll be posted, uh, and so you'll have a lot more information that you can have follow-up uh, posted on the website. Um, Heather, anything you want to say? We have a video to play as we're exiting, but is there any last words that you'd like to say? Um, absolutely. Uh, if, if you have questions or um, issues that you see um, that you'd like us to know about or look into, please send them to West Seattle Bridge at seattle.gov. We're very happy to receive your input and uh, your, your suggestions. Um, we'll look into them and we'll certainly answer every question. You got to be a little bit patient because we get a lot of questions. Uh, also, if you have not subscribed to our regular updates, you can sign up for that at uh, seattle.gov slash West Seattle Bridge. Um, if you look on the right hand side of the screen, there's a button that says uh, subscribe. So click that and you can choose to get emails delivered to you. That way you will be 100% up to date with what is happening. Uh, I'd like to thank everybody for coming tonight. I know there are other ways you could spend your time. Uh, I also know that there are lots of questions that we didn't get to. So we will be answering all of those and providing those answers uh, to the public. So uh, thank you so much. And we'll go over to that, that video. Yeah, so as we close the meeting, um, you can stay and watch a new video. It's, it's hot off the presses. Um, that was produced and it, it um, reflects community, you know, community members provided input through interviews so they could share what they've experienced. Um, we hope you like it. And then when the video is over, we'll, we'll close the meeting. So thanks all. The West Seattle High Rise Bridge is the city's most used street, typically carrying more than 100,000 travelers every day. The bridge has been closed since March 2020 after growing cracks in the structure were found during a routine inspection. We immediately set to work on emergency stabilization work, which successfully halted the cracks from growing larger and kept the bridge standing 
but additional work is needed to further strengthen the bridge to support the weight and stress of daily traffic. We know the bridge closure has caused disruptions to the area. We are hard at work repairing the bridge and are happy to report that it is currently on track to reopen in mid-2022. I saw a lot of traffic, um, a lot of traffic, and I saw a lot of youth trying to walk around and ride their bikes. It's really scary because the commuters start learning the, the back roads, and then once they start learning the back roads, they start speeding through the back roads. People throughout West Seattle have had to use detour routes with longer travel times and more traffic to reach the rest of the city while the bridge is closed. And the neighborhoods along the detour routes, specifically the people and businesses in Georgetown, South Park, and Highland Park, have experienced both the bridge closure and the additional impacts of detour traffic diverted into and through their neighborhoods. We wanted to help ease the impacts along the detour route by keeping drivers on the wider detour streets and away from narrower family-focused neighborhood streets. Georgetown has a history of air pollution, higher rate of asthma in our community. You know, a lot of studies that have been done you know, link that back to kind of our, our air quality or poor air quality. So when we have more vehicles uh, on the road in our neighborhoods, it's negative for the community members that live there. You know, I think we wanted to get uh, community input. Uh, we did uh, neighborhood walks with uh, SDOT and the Department of Neighborhoods. We had multiple community meetings talking to people within the city to see how we could help make our streets more safe, help try to direct traffic elsewhere and slow down the traffic that's coming through our neighborhood. Now we are starting to see that relief. Now that we can return to work that we we can start to get better economically. People think that we are just neighborhood but not real, a really business district. So now we are more kind of depressed because we have all the issues that we have in the past, plus all this traffic, all these people that they don't want to know everything, they just want to go through because they are in a hurry. A, a, huge part of my community is immigrant. So they don't receive this type of stimulus and it's harder. Through broad outreach and community engagement, we learned that people along the detour routes were indeed concerned about increased traffic, pedestrian safety, and environmental and health impacts. As a result, we implemented home zones in their neighborhoods. A home zone keeps residential streets people-focused by installing traffic circles, speed humps, lit crosswalks, multilingual traffic safety signs, and closes some streets to through traffic. With the home zone plan, we've put in, you know, literally over 60 speed humps in this area and changed light patterns and, you know, added some crosswalks and things like that. But now they kind of have to wait and see how it performs. We also heard requests from impacted communities about expanding vehicle access to the Spokane Street Swing Bridge, which has been restricted to transit, freight, and emergency vehicles since the high bridge closed to keep it from getting overloaded with detour traffic. Based on this feedback, we are now giving temporary access across the Spokane Street Swing Bridge for people going to life-saving medical appointments, on-call medical workers, maritime businesses and restaurants and retail businesses that have been doubly affected by both the bridge closure and the COVID pandemic. If you do not have access, be careful to avoid the low bridge during the day when driving. You will receive a $75 fine each time you cross the bridge. And remember, the low bridge is always open for all who are walking, biking or rolling. As COVID restrictions lift, streets are getting busier every day and it's becoming clear that we all need to do our part to reduce congestion by rethinking the ways we get around. If you can, please skip the drive across the bridges at the busiest times. Bike, walk, use transit, or stay and shop local in West Seattle. These decisions can help reduce congestion for people making essential trips and help protect the health of your neighbors living in the most impacted areas. To find out more about trip planning and travel options, 
the repair of the West Seattle Bridge, Spokane Street Swing Bridge access, neighborhood home zones projects, and all the other work happening to get people back on the West Seattle Bridge and help everyone endure the closure, please visit the project website at seattle.gov forward slash West Seattle Bridge. Call our multilingual phone line at 206 400 or email us at West Seattle Bridge at seattle.gov today. Please sign up for email updates by clicking the subscribe now button under latest news. We know you've been through a lot this past year and we thank you for your patience and resilience. We're looking forward to reconnecting West Seattle in 2022. Thank you.